Hello, everybody. On today's episode, I have on a married couple of journalists who have been researching Afghanistan for decades. They have been able to watch the degradation of culture happen year by year as the reach of the U.S. government has grown. They have written several books about Afghanistan. Everybody welcome Paul Fitzgerald and Elizabeth Gould to the show. <laughs> welcome to the show, Paul and Liz. How are you guys? We're great. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you for coming on. So I want to tell the audience a little bit of how I came to know you. Uh, I was I happened to be blessed by Bruce de Torres to send me a link to a roundtable in which you guys were featured and speaking about Afghanistan. And it's uh, a whole series of roundtable events that are going to be happening. And you guys were the first one to Afghanistan. And I got a hats off to you. You know, that was an amazing presentation and I learned so much from you. So thank you for that. But uh, you guys have been researching Afghanistan for a few decades now, right? Well, it goes back actually, you know, we originally connected to Afghanistan back in 1979, you know, when the Soviets invaded in uh, December 27th. Um, you know, so the whole idea that Afghanistan kind of for most Americans began in 2001, 9-11, that became the sort of door. You know, we've been talking about it for 20 years already. Wow. Trying to warn people that it was important, that right. there was something going to happen, that the whole thing <clears throat> was building to this, what we now know became 9-11, um, you know, and what, what did that mean and how did it come to be without, we have came to realize, without going back to the original adventure that started in the Carter administration, it's, it's completely impossible for Americans to grasp how it happened. Well, I had a TV show on <clears throat> the local uh, Christian Broadcasting Network affiliate, that Channel 25, WXNE. And uh, it was a public affairs program. It was very simple. Uh, it was knee, two chairs, and a plant, I think is what they call it. And um, <clears throat> the, the station was running a documentary called The Salt Syndrome, which was about um, the uh, SALT treaty with the Soviet Union. And uh, it, was, it, it was clearly from one particular point of view. And at the time, uh, the federal government had uh, the um, fairness doctrine, they called it. And you were supposed to present an opposite point of view. So we decided that we would um, make a documentary. And I, I went to the station manager and I said, uh, you know, we, we really have to answer this this particular point of view with something that's, you know, that's a little bit more balanced to balance it. And so there were a lot of people in the area, in uh, the Boston area where we live, who had been in the Manhattan Project, uh, specific people who actually were involved in the process. So we got to really get in there and talk to these people firsthand about what the issues were back in the 1940s, and how you know when we were fighting the uh, fighting the Germans in World War II and the Japanese, and then suddenly we turned around and suddenly we were fighting the this thing called the Soviet Union and what was this really all about and how did it happen and all that sort of thing. So it was an education for us. So uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, the economist, opened his doors. He had run the Office of uh, Price Administration during World War II for the Roosevelt administration. He opened his doors for us in Harvard Square. We came in and we sat with him for a couple of afternoons and got the whole story about what he felt was going on in terms of the arms race. And so, you know, there were a lot of things that were happening in the country, similar things, the effects of which we're getting today, actually. The, the roads needed to be rebuilt. The sewer systems needed to be redone. Well, that was the effect, actually, of the Vietnam mm -hmm. War that had just ended in 1975 <sighs> and the impact on the basically on the civilian economy was what right. needed to be reinvested in at that point. So we were focused on, you know, where, where to direct this enormous amount of money that they were talking about in Washington, how to put it. And here we are again, talking about an infrastructure bill. It's, it's right before Congress right now, as we speak. And so the, we were there in 1979. And so we, we went around and we, uh, we introduced ourselves to the, the, the person, the man who had it negotiated the SALT II Treaty, Strategic Arms Limitation. And uh, we saw they were giving kind of prophecies about what would happen if we didn't do this. 
reinvest in the American economy. Reinvest in the American economy mm -hmm. and spend time, you know, getting America back to a place where it wasn't based on war, it was based on peace. And so what kind of peace was that going to be? So that was a big issue at the time. And, uh, you know, Channel 25, uh, CBN was behind us on this effort to try to do this. And uh, it, was, it was great, we, we really did. Pat Robertson's son used to work out of the station, Chris, where, where, where I was uh, housed. So uh, we got to really kind of get into the whole issue of what was going on with Christian broadcasting and what was going on with the arms race and a lot of that stuff. And, and so we got a really full perspective of it. And uh, so I had also been in a lot of political campaigns here in Massachusetts. So I was familiar with some of the people who were involved uh, nationally and internationally in these issues. So at any rate, we put a documentary together and about the arms race and what was gonna happen called Arms Race and the Economy, a Delicate Balance. And lo and behold, what happens is the Soviets invade Afghanistan, a country that, that bordered there, that was sat on their southern border. And so it just threw everything right out the window, everything that we had been talking to about people in Washington about negotiating with the Soviets and, and uh, calming the international situation down suddenly got inflamed. And so we said, you know, this is really uh, unusual. And, uh, and so then a short time later, the uh, Afghan government expelled the entire Western media. It was a total blackout. So um, I, I said to Liz during the summer of 1980, I said, you know, what if we could break the blackout? What if we could somehow get into Afghanistan and see what was really going on and what this is really all about? And so that was the summer of 1980. And that began our, our first hand uh, exploration of what the Afghanistan really of uh, the issue was not to just us and the so in, in the United States, but also to the Soviet Union, but also actually to the to Afghanistan itself. Right. I think that was the real entry that we understood was that we were entering into that point between the United States and the Soviet Union became the flashpoint, which was Afghanistan. Mm -hmm which is actually referred to as the graveyard of empires. So it is a very profound place to have entered into at that right, moment. Right. Yeah, Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empires? Yes, that's wow, it. Wow, I've never heard that. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, yes. So, so it seems to me uh, from what you're saying here and what I heard you say uh, before was that Afghanistan plays a key role and the two dominant powers of the 19th and now 20th centuries have been Russia or Soviet Union and the United States. And there's been some kind of battle for Afghanistan. And, and before we got started, you mentioned that there might be some mystical uh, types of connections in this. Do you want to get into that a little bit? We could do that. Um, you know, before the United States became the empire that we know it as, it was the British Empire. The United States picked up the British Empire at the end of World War II. And the, the British Empire was uh, more than just a military empire, it was a cultural empire. And that culture began in the 16th century. Uh, it began uh, under Queen Elizabeth I. Ironically, we now have Queen Elizabeth II ruling in London. And Queen Elizabeth I was really the, uh, the, the first monarch to to rule over an empire that was intentionally set out to be an empire. Um, uh, she had some very mystical companions in her effort to do this. John Dee, uh, the philosopher, uh, uh, Sir Philip Sidney, uh, uh, all of the, the, the things that were done during that time period, the literature that was created during that time period um, was kind of a mystical, uh, well, you know, mystical imperialism, let's put it that way. In fact, it was wow. referred to as mystical imperialism by Cecil Rhodes. Um, 19 well, it, actually, the, the definition of mystical imperialism was based on Cecil Rhodes right. and, and what he used to justify 
basically eventually uh, colonizing Africa and, col and, and his uh, right. whole idea uh, of spreading Western civilization. Right, and he's the one that the Rhodes Scholars named after, yes, right? And he, exactly, he's the first exactly. one to use the term New World Order. Exactly. Like a exactly. hundred years to, I think, a hundred years to the day before George H.W. Bush had that speech in 91 where he said, we were now under a New World Order. So this is, this is, uh, just mind blowing. I didn't know that there was this connection, and oh, yeah. uh, and you know, you keep going. I mean, this this <laughs> I is think, well, great. He's the guy who actually coined the term, I believe, mystical imperialism, because well, he, I think it was coined for him. Well, he wanted to he wanted to spread this kind of British imperial mystical imperial idea across the globe. Right, but, and he was yeah. real big into uh, white supremacy. He was always pushing that that the well, and that part of uh, what was he a Freemason or was it the Illuminati? I think it. I uh, think more Illuminati than Freemason, but it, yeah. you know the but two there, kind there, of merge. There, there are many yeah. of these yeah. aspects, you know, yeah. whether it's skull and bones or you know. There yeah, are it's all amazing. Kinds of, right. There are circles within circles right, within right. circles. But the idea, I think, that that Rhodes really represented yeah. was an application of being able to take uh, the, the, the see, mystical imperialism is the idealism, all right? right? This is an idea. And you then have to bring that idea and plant it in the earth. That requires you convincing a lot of actual people and actual power to come your way. And if you're a leader, you have to inspire them. That's where the mysticism comes in. You have to invoke effectively the power of the dream, the power of the imagination, the power of the realm where God lives. And that's where the the whole idea that God comes down through whoever has invoking this wow. power. And that's what, that's what Cecil Rhodes was able to do and inspire a lot of other people around him. Okay. But he, he, this is not the first empire. I, you know, this is, I think what we're really living in is the final stage of imperial thinking of the imperial realm of the imperial experience. And that these are the, the men or the individuals or the humans that actually were able to embody it in some way and help land it into the earth. All right. And, and then we have to deal with the consequences and, you know, and the effect of it. And we can see under certain circumstances, it's fantastic. In other, other circumstances, it is a war crime. So we, we have to reconcile all of those issues about what imperialism is as it embodies in a human being called either you know a president or a king or a pharaoh or whatever we use right. as a term right. that embodies this power. So we started out I, referring to this effort that we were trying to do as the Apostles' Diary. Uh, when we got into Afghanistan, we didn't realize that there are things about Afghanistan that are um, kind of um, mystical in the sense that once you enter Afghanistan, it's not just what it means to you personally, it's what you mean to it. Uh, you become identified with it uh, in some kind of way. And we discovered that we, even when we tried to walk away from the story, because it became too difficult for us to carry it forward on our own, when we were doing this in the 1990s, it came back to us over and over, over and in, over in ways that again. you would just, yeah. wait a minute, how is this possible? Yeah. And it even it, it, it impacted our daughter as well. Uh, she would be out, you know, taking a taxi cab in, in uh, San Francisco in the early 2000s. And she would see on the cab registry the, the license that the guy was an Afghan. And so she'd said, my parents were in Afghanistan. And so she, he said, when were they there? And she told him, he says, oh, I met your father. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. 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 He, he came. He, she, the guy turned out to be someone who had left Afghanistan after the Soviets yeah. departed and come to the United States, and uh, he ran Afghan television. When I, Paul, yeah, when Paul met him in the studio. When I met him in the studio, in he gave me, I asked him for, you yeah. know, stuff that had been shot in the countryside yeah. and some various things right. that had happened wow, around the city. that's amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. things like that. And, and also, too, um, another thing happened that was even, even cool. more strange. Uh, this was an event that occurred when we first went in 1981, we negotiated a deal with CBS News for an exclusive story. We had the access, they wanted, they wanted the story. 
it was the first breakthrough yeah. since, the, since the Western media had been kicked out. And so we were the first ones to negotiate a, a valid entry. We didn't have to go over the mountains. We got on a plane. We went in with, with visas and we went in and- With a film crew. With a film crew yeah. from CBS. It was my own film crew, but I, I had picked them. But we were doing it for CBS News. So um, the guy that we negotiated with was a guy named Peter Larkin. And he was a hardcore uh, CBS News veteran. He had been the uh, CIA, uh, CIA. He had been the CBS News station chief in uh, Afghanistan, in uh, Saigon. Saigon during the Vietnam War. So he really, he was, a, as I said, hardcore. He'd been wounded there with film crews out in the countryside. So he was dedicated well, he, to telling he, the story of Afghanistan. He had been wounded to the point where for the rest of his life, he had to swim almost every day to get rid of the pain yeah. from the wounds he got in Vietnam. Oh, man. Yeah. So, so we you know, contacted him. We got involved with it. And uh, they sent us to Afghanistan. We came back. And they did a seven-minute story about three weeks later. And, uh, and so then we, bent, we went back again two years later with Roger Fisher from the Harvard Negotiation Project because the rumor was out that um, the Soviets really didn't want to be in Afghanistan. They really wanted to get out as quickly as possible. And Roger Fisher, who had done a lot of international negotiating, uh, knew a lot of Russians, and they had said the same thing. He had gone to the Soviet Union in 1982, in the fall, in the spring of 1982. And they had said to him, you know, look, how do we get out of this? What do we do? We, have, we don't know the American system. We don't know how to work with it. So when we asked him if he would go with us on another trip, he said, yes, I'll do it. So we get to Kabul in 1983, the spring of 1983. He goes around, he just disappears. We get into the hotel and um, I, I said to Liz, I said, where did Roger go? And he just, he had just disappeared. He, he goes out the door, grabs a taxi cab, goes over to the Soviet embassy. He'd made arrangements ahead of time, didn't tell anybody. He comes back to the hotel about five o'clock in time for dinner. And he says, I just came almost had the most amazing meeting with the Soviets. They don't want to be here. They, well, they really the don't. The Soviets actually had sent down their highest level Afghan expert right. to meet with Roger because of us bringing him to Afghanistan. Wow. To tell him personally, right. they do not want to be in Afghanistan. They made a terrible mistake. And that if you give us six months, this is what he was told by this, this Soviet expert. If you give us six months to withdraw, basically right. without embarrassment, you know, we yeah. made a terrible mistake. Okay, we will right. leave. And obviously what he needed though, in order for that to happen was no more provocations from Pakistan, which, were, which was where the Mushahideen were sending in uh, the 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 Mushahideen were were destroying the civil society. They were destroying schools and officials and the activity of life itself. And so that was the condition, and that was all part of what was not known on the American side was that um, the actual provocations that were coming from Pakistan were actually being financed by Saudi Arabia. They were not. Just wow, tangled web we weave. Yes, yeah. exactly. They were not just innocent Mushahideen who simply wanted their country back. They were actually very much connected at a large by, level. A, by a radical. Yeah. Islam, they were using. They Islam were using. Is, they were yeah. using it as a. The Wahhabists were using it yeah. to spread radical Islam. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Where yeah. Afghanistan never had that kind of Islam before. They had a very. Par uh, uh, Kabul was considered the Paris of Central Asia. It was a beautiful city. Well, uh, one of the things that I think says a lot about what was going on in Afghanistan in the 1970s, if you went to our website where we have photograph, it, it called valediction.net, there is a photograph of three Afghan women walking <clears throat> on Kabul University in the 1970s. And the fact is in the 1970s, Afghan women made up over 60% of Kabul University's population as students, which wow. I think really says a lot about the it misunderstanding does. about what was going mm -hmm. on in Afghanistan and how the, the crisis was created was a complete misrepresentation of Afghanistan itself. Right. Well, I wanted to jump in here and, and say, like, you, so, so you guys kind of helped 
in a way you didn't even know you were doing by bringing this gentleman Roger over there. You kind of helped facilitate the Soviets' exit out of Afghanistan. So, you know, that's a, an amazing feat in itself. You guys, uh, I, I mean, this is an incredible story that the two of you have. Uh, and so back to what you were saying about uh, Saudi Arabia funding it, you know, that brings me right away to 9-11, how it was 19 alleged, 19 attackers from Saudi Arabia, but yet Afghanistan and uh, Iraq are the two countries where the United States invades. And in fact, the, like, the only country that w hasn't been affected in the Middle East by the United States is Saudi Arabia, the one exactly. with the alleged 19 attackers where there was, uh, what, two passports that were untouched that were just laying on top of the rubble. <laughs> Isn't that right. something, huh? Yeah, amazing, yeah. yeah. Crazy, Happy. crazy stuff. Uh, yeah. so, so, you know, there were recent events that occurred in Afghanistan. Uh, what is your take on the exit of the United States military from Afghanistan? I actually, um, you know, it... it, it what it reveals is, you know, there, there's actually a, a you know, a, a, a visual of what happened at the end of the Vietnam War with the helicopters coming in and trying to remove um, all the, uh, you know, the, 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 the people that had to work with the United States, um, the various, you know, people, all right, and there was a lot of similarities, okay, but there was one difference that I think is very important. There is no complete similarity to what the Taliban are and what the mm -hmm. Viet Cong were, okay? The Viet Cong were actually, you know, connected to North Vietnam. They were a nationalist group that were connected to the North Vietnamese, you know, relationship to South Vietnam, okay? The Taliban are not um, just Afghans, okay? This goes back to the relationship between uh, the creation of the Taliban, which According to um, Chuck Hogan, who's someone we interviewed, who was the director of operations for South Central Asia from 1979 to 84, who described the Taliban as a wholly owned subsidiary of Pakistani intelligence. And what's important to understand about Pakistan is that Pakistan actually was created mostly out of Afghanistan. When the British left the region in 1947, what they left in place was a country which became the first, it was actually uh, the first uh, actually state that was created uh, based on a religion, okay? Israel was actually the second state. Pakistan oh, wow. was created first, okay, uh, based on Islam. And then Israel was created based on Judaism. So both are creations of the British empire leaving the region and leaving in place a very destabilizing, very, um, Con, a, a contrived situation that was going to have a hard time finding its own natural roots and origin to this thing. And so they, they radicalized to, two religions and gave yes, them states yes. right next to each other so exactly, that they would keep yes. on warring forever. Well, yes. and, empo the, and empowered them. Yeah, but the yeah, U.S. Well. basically chose at the end of uh, 1947, the U.S. was very influenced by British uh, intelligence and British ideas and basically kind of took over the British idea of the region. And what they did is they chose Pakistan as their partner. And Pakistan was very British, uh, you know, British directed uh, and Pakistani intelligence, especially. In fact, the British, uh, Pakistani intelligence is, you know, it, Pakistan is referred to as a country that uh, I think the intelligence owns the country instead of the country owning the intelligence, okay? So Pakistani intelligence, according to Chuck Hogan, was the creation of the Taliban. They were the, the ones who guided it. And even after 9-11, when the U.S. went in and basically supposedly got rid of the Taliban, they ran right into Pakistan and got taken care of. Mm -hmm. So that has been going on for 20 years. So the idea that somehow the Taliban magically takes over as this native uh, powerful group that just were so nationalistic, you know, is really not a fair explanation of the complexity of underlying influences and, and, and the things that actually gave them the power at critical moments. And especially when you look at the way the US actually was not really investing in the Afghan people, 
They were not investing in the civil society. They were, in fact, uh, when the US went in and removed the Taliban and they gave the Afghans the opportunity to quote, take their country back. And they had the Berlin conference that was the opportunity the, the Afghan people wanted to bring back the king who had been exiled in Italy. And Zolme Halizad, who was a neocon who had been trained by Wolfstetter, who was part of the US administration, denied the Afghan lawyer Jirga, which is their own grand council that had decided that they wanted this return of the king and said no. And they installed Karzai. Okay. So Every time, so the idea that somehow this is an authentic, organic right. expression of anything is completely misplaced. And the fact right? is, Hamid Karzai was, a, was an extremist. He was a more moderate extremist, a more mo moderate Islamist, but he was not somebody that the United States could work with in terms of him being an, uh, uh, a moderate Democrat, let's put it that way. Well, in the other terms of establishing a nation state, the whole idea is, is that the nation state was against everything that the Islamists stood for. They wanted to pan Islamism. They wanted to control the, the entire Islamic section of the world from Africa all the way up into Central Asia. And that's exactly what played into uh, the thinking of the Carter White House in the 1970s and Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the national security advisor for Jimmy Carter. Right, wow. and that is very much tied into the idea that the pan-Islamists actually were a creation of the British Empire in the 19th century. So you really have, you know, and right. what was the pan-Islamism? It was connecting to what we're now looking at today, which is the globalism. These are, mm -hmm. they are beyond nation states and they serve the needs <clears throat> of a globalist agenda. So these are the Islamists that signed on with the global agenda that connected to the British Empire in the 19th century. Right. So and that's what you're looking at. With what the, we're with the seeing, Taliban. we are seeing a kind of fulfillment of that 19th century British effort. In fact, George Ball, who was uh, one of these people who had under Secretary of State back in the 1960s, uh, actually suggested at one point, and a globalist, he suggested that the world should be run by a new world government that was based on the East India Company. The East India Company was founded in 1600 by Queen Elizabeth I and her, it was chartered back in 1600 by Queen Elizabeth I and her advocates. And so that's where you get- That was the Boston origin. Tea Party. Yeah, that's where you get the origin, exactly. That's exactly. where you get the origin of the mystical imperialism came out of this kind of 16th century, very Kabbalistic, uh, group of people who were operating in the British Empire who wanted to express the, this, uh, the whole, uh, whole uh, library full of, of information based on the mystical efforts of the Elizabethans to establish the Queen Elizabeth as the, the queen of heaven uh, and replace, mm -hmm. once again, there was, a, there was a struggle between Rome and London during that, during that time period. And they wanted to replace Mary with Queen Elizabeth. So that was the effort that was done uh, during that time period. And it, oh, and it wow. kind of came to fruition with the East India Company. And that's exactly what has moved from century to century to century and to the 21st century. And now we're, we're kind of facing the ultimate end of what that really began with 400 years ago. Wow, so uh, I wanna get into the Taliban a little bit here because you know, I've always been told that the Taliban were a certain way, and I have no way of verifying how they are. You know, I can only go by what I'm provided, the evidence that I'm provided, and my best, uh, you know, my best guess, really, and what all of us have. We can depend on the news, we can depend on independent journalists, mm -hmm. but anyone could be lying for any given reason. So, uh, so in my take, uh, the Taliban, it seems that they have replaced what once was called the Al Qaeda. Is that correct? Or are they completely different? You know, I'd say that's a pretty accurate description, personally. Okay. Um, what I just said to you about what, you know, Chuck Kogan, you know, made clear, which is the, the, the Taliban was a creation of Pakistani intelligence. What happened after, okay, you've got to go back to the original crisis in Afghanistan, okay, when the Mujahideen were actually released and 
you know, defined as freedom fighters that were going to free Afghanistan from the evil commie, uh, you know, takeover. And the Soviet Union was there to take over the world. That was the setup, okay? And that goes back to 1979, all right? And then eventually what happened was throughout the 1980s, all right, there was a, a process that was going on, all right? And there was a wearing down process. Well, what was also wearing down in this process was actually the Soviet Union. It was a beginning to actually disintegrate from within. And it wasn't just because of this, of what happened in Afghanistan. The Soviet Union was on its decline before that happened, okay? So right. this hastened it, all right? So they were dealing with a neighbor. Remember, you got to remember that Afghanistan was actually a neighbor. They had had an agreement going back to 1917 with the creation of the Bolshevik revolution with Afghanistan. So we have long history of relationship. There was an evolution. It wasn't just a takeover issue, all right? But what happened in 19, when, when the Soviets were involved with Afghanistan during actually going back to the 1940s, especially after the creation of Pakistan, the U.S. literally rejected doing anything for Afghanistan after the creation of Pakistan. They became a partner of Pakistan. They told Afghanistan, you're in the sphere of influence of the Soviets. And the Soviets actually were trying to help them economically. And a lot of the idea about what happened there is, you know, there's a lot of basic information. They were building apartment buildings and roads and bus service and trains and you know, they were helping them in basic ways they were right on their southern border they did not want to cause a major crisis in all their southern republics which are all muslim they wanted that to be a calm area including afghanistan so that was a major goal of the soviet union at that point and what took over after uh Carter got elected, President Carter. Brzezinski, is a big net Brzezinski, his national security advisor, basically comes in with an agenda. He decided he was going to stir up as much trouble on the southern border of the Soviet Union to try and create a rebellion mm. through the, the Muslim states. So they were using them as pawns to get at the Soviet Union. Exactly. Yes. But, but the Taliban itself are... are you know, they're a much more sophisticated military creation. By Pakistani intelligence, yeah. Right. Uh, they were something that has been, uh, that were cooked up, they were uh, trained. You had a lot of, uh, society was completely destroyed in Afghanistan during the 1980s. It was, it was atomized. And so you had all of these young boys who were living in these refugee, Pakistan, in Pakistan, refugee yeah. camps who were taken in by Pakistan's intelligence service and brought into these these um, sh shuras in uh, Pakistan and educated in this extremist Wahhabi uh, from Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, form of Islam, and which was not indigenous to Afghanistan at all. And so this, this kind of core of religious students, the Taliban, the Talibs, the followers uh, of uh, the prophet, uh, became educated and recruited and, and, and of course, uh, educated by military people. And that's, that became the vanguard. And so most of the Mujahideen that the United States was supporting were so corrupted, the drug dealing and the, they had absolutely a lawless situation. They could never get together. They never wanted to form any government. In fact, they actually got to Kabul at one point and they tried to convene a, jur a jurgo where they would create a government and they couldn't do it. And so Gulbuddin Hekmatyar wound up uh, shelling a big part of the city fighting between with other Mujahideen groups. And so as a result, what happened is, is that the Pakistanis finally said, we'll create this group of our own and we'll go in and they wound up using Pakistani military people together with some of these young students, put them together and then they basically swept through the country because they were organized and they were backed by a, a central force. A so so was the Taliban, are they uh, like a, just a regular, uh, to make it Americanized, is it just like a street gang or is it more like a mafioso uh, or is it more like a state government? Well, I would- A call, combination. I'd call it an, okay. you know, they're a group of irregulars. Well, okay? but I don't okay. know what I mean. Run by the Pakistani no, military. I, I think that the, well, the, the simple 
explanation to address what you just asked would be, okay, Afghanistan was traumatized, obviously, after the Soviet invasion that became a cause celebre for America to claim that this was a takeover of the world by the Soviet Union and it was godless communism and the Mujahideen were defined as freedom fighters. Most of the Mujahideen were actually, um, in many cases, drug dealers, um, they were warlords, uh, you know, they, they were all kinds of, uh, you know, qualities that, that, that were never made clear about what these people came from, all right? And, but they were defined as freedom, that was the term that Re President Reagan used when he met them, freedom fighters. So this is all part of the propaganda about what they were, okay? In fact, these, uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatar was the most famous one. He actually was an Afghan that left Afghanistan because he was already notorious in 1973 uh, when there, he was put in jail for killing a, a student at Kabul University. And he left Afghanistan and he started working with the Pakistanis against Afghanistan. This was 1973. So this is the man that ultimately ended up getting the largest majority of the money that was being funneled into Afghanistan through Saudi Arabia and all the other sources. He became a billionaire um, and he was a drug dealer. And you know, so this is the kind of and person- And probably still is. And probably still is, and he's still out there. Okay, um, so, the, but, but the, the sort of mythology about who these people were got kind of set by Reagan describing <clears> them as freedom fighters. So eventually what ended up happening was all the various warlords that they had put together calling them the Mujahideen, the nationalists supposedly who wanted to free Afghan from the evil empire, especially the godless communists, okay, turned out to be so warrior-like amongst themselves in 1992, when the last government of Afghanistan was finally ended, okay, after the Soviets withdrew in 1989, um, the Najibullah government fell, all right, at three years later, and then they started warring with each other. So basically, the warring Mujahideen ended up destroying, actually, Kabul and killing over 50,000 Afghans in their war, and that's wow. when the, that's when the the Pakistani intelligence <sighs> took the Taliban and then put them in to fix the mess. And they're okay. the ones who took over, all right? Yeah, the Taliban actually, uh, they're, they're so run by the Pakistani military. The military actually okay. hired a, a PR firm in Washington back when they first got going in the early 90s in order to test what would be the best name for this group to put forward for Western media to get them accepted. And they came up with this thing called the Taliban. That was actually well known. And uh, in, in, the, over the last 20 years, the Pakistani military has harbored all the people that were shooting at American soldiers, all the people that had created the problems in the first place that harbored Osama bin Laden. All of those people are all have all been sheltered. I mean, they finally went and uh, you know over the border and supposedly got this guy, you know whoever was killed, we, were, we, heard, we heard years ago that Os Osama bin Laden had been killed. He well, died no, actually, no. he was very ill. We, we, heard, well, he had we were told decades ago that uh, bin Laden actually had kidney failure and died years before the supposed so execution. So whoever, whoever was we killed- We don't know for sure, but that's- Whoever was killed told, and yeah. dropped in the ocean yeah. is, is, is up for, yeah. you know, it's one of the big- Yeah, well, yeah. of course, and they say that was a uh, an Islamic burial, but you know, that's complete horseshit. Yeah, uh, yeah, right, right, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, the number one up. terrorist. Right. They didn't want any evidence. That's what- They make it up right. as they go in along. In fact, when yeah. we heard right. what they did to supposed bin Laden's body, it convinced us even more that the rumor we had heard was probably true. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you heard that years before 9-11. Oh and that. the fact yeah, is, is yeah. that we knew, you know, we were told, um, you know, by certain Afghans that things were happening prior to 2000, good, prior to 9-11, we were told that something was going to happen. We didn't know what it would be, but we were told that was, there were some, some people that were working with one of the uh, Mujahideen rebels, Abdul Haq, and uh, they called him Holly, Hollywood Haq. He got a lot of publicity back in the 1980s. <laughs> under the Reagan administration, but uh, that he was going, he was one of the favorites of some of the people who were trying to 
to get rid of the, you know, to calm the situation down and, and put this guy in charge of, of the Afghan government. And uh, we heard that happening. So when 9-11 happened, it was like there were a lot of rumblings going on here and there as to something was going to happen, but nobody really knew what it was going to be. And then of course we get this whole thing with Saudi Arabia and who do they attack? They attack Iraq. Iraq yeah. had nothing to do with well, first that. Then, so, Iraq, you know, yeah. once again, you know, the American people have been fed a line on Afghanistan going back to 1979 and all through the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s. And, and now it just did this. Everyone's kind of used to this kind of imaginary, you know, imaginary friend that we have called Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now it's the, and now it's the Taliban being viewed yes. as the saving grace come that they, oh, they, they cut down the evil empire. Now the evil empire is the United well, we've States. We've got a local newsman here who was interviewing Madeleine Albright back in the 1990s. And he said, I swear to God, she said, they're a cleansing force. We have to support the, that, this was during the Clinton administration. We have to support the Taliban because they're a cleansing force. So I mean, that was the attitude. And so we've been getting this kind of, you know, yeah, we support them, but no, we don't support them. And that's why we put out a book uh, in mm -hmm. 2011 called Crossing Zero, because the line, the military demarcation line between Afghanistan and Pakistan was called Zero Line. And so we put out a book and it was called, we were crossing zero. And, and we did not give a good forecast of what would happen in, in this effort by the it's United States, obvious, because yeah. you can't fight on both sides of the line at the same time mm -hmm. and come out the winner. Somebody's got to lose. And, uh, and so we know who lost at this point. The Afghan people lost from the very beginning. Absolutely, yeah. And you know what, what we're talking about here uh, with these different uh, groups of freedom fighters uh, that are being used as, oh, they're good now when they help my agenda, they're bad when they yeah. don't help my agenda. Right. Yeah. And, and then we're, we're talking about Osama bin Laden was killed. And also in that, uh, around that time uh, was uh, Obama, well, maybe a few years later, Obama talks about the creating of ISIL. He called them ISIL. That was ISIS, but he would refer to them as ISIL. And in several different uh, presidential conferences, he went out and said, uh, we are arming and training ISIL forces in order to combat the Taliban. So, so, and now, as we're leaving now, the Taliban are the ones protecting the Americans from ISIS-K. And it's like, right. what, what is going on? Like, the George Bush uh, era did mess with these people, and then Obama messed with these people, and now Biden's messing with these people. You know, I just, I don't know what is going on in this world, <laughs> but I see that it's all connected, and it's all lies, and the, the propaganda... Uh, as you guys have dealt with for uh, what forty some years now, yeah, I mean exactly. this is this is just uh, insanity. I remember seeing pictures <laughs> of like Iran and Afghanistan of women on the beaches in bikinis, and oh, it was regular well, times. Well, you know, I think that one point I would like to make very clearly is that Afghanistan was a country modernizing; they were democratic minded. They gave women the right to vote in 1923. And I think that's something to really take in because the Afghan women did not have to ask for that right. They were given that right. And that's just four years after America, you know, exactly, women had to fight for it here. Exactly, so that's exactly my point. And that's why I like to point out, if you want to really get a feeling for the real Afghan people before they were traumatized by what the US did to them, by choosing to make this the place to win the Cold War against the Soviet Union, who had no interest in making this their final glory days, quite honestly. And that's really important to take in, okay? You look at this picture and you see the look on these three women's faces and you can see the, they were the, walking through Kabul University where over 60% of the students were females. And you can see a confidence and a beauty and an extension, it, it's very obvious. This picture embodies it, okay? And this is what was really robbed from the Afghan people, all right? By the choices that were made, clearly we feel personally that it was the Carter administration through Zbigniew Brzezinski that really activated the plan. They were not clearly alone in this activation, but it was a whole system 
that really wanted this to happen, but they were the ones who activated it. And Brzezinski was the one who was able to literally make it happen. He was the one who boasted in 1998 that he had tricked the Soviets into Afghanistan and he boasted about it in an interview. To this day, there are American politicians who wanna deny that that interview ever happened, but it did. And Brzezinski himself told Chuck Hogan, and we have Chuck Hogan on tape admitting it, that he admitted to him it was true. He did trick the Soviets into Afghanistan. And that is something that Americans, I think, really need to kind of take in. What, you know, what is it? What kind of award? What kind of, 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 of choice is that when you make something happen that you then trick everyone into believing is something else? What's the point? So this is all mm -hmm. part of what we're trying to say is that the, the real victim it's not about America or the Soviet Union. The victims are the Afghan people. And this is what we're here to represent. We are here representing the voice of the Afghan people that have been completely lost in this whole horror. And to see the Taliban being emulated as legitimate to take over Afghanistan is the, is the, you know, is the ultimate horror and crime against but then the look, Afghan people. Look what's telling you that. Yeah, we have a government that, you know, is clearly putting out false narratives on a regular right. basis and telling us to believe in them. Why should we believe them? Because they tell us to. Right. Uh, you know, there, there, there's no proof involved with it. And the proof is in the pudding in this particular case. Well, I think yeah. Afghanistan is a window into how how this thing operates and and who who it's operating for. And believe me, it's not for you and me. It's not for our people. It's not for the people. It's not for the people of this country. It certainly wasn't for the people of Afghanistan. Afghanistan no. And so uh, now we're being treated in the same manner. Yeah. Right. Are you guys familiar with Operation Mockingbird? I think so. So uh, this was a CIA operation in which they have undercover agents of uh, go uh, pose as the media as journalists on on our TVs and all so I bring that up yeah because uh, so this was in the 70s it was uh it was declassified I think it was like 79 it was declassified uh -huh. but it's still going on today you know CNN uh has uh what's his name Anderson uh Anderson Cooper, Cooper Anderson yeah yeah Anderson. Cooper Anderson and yeah Anderson Cooper uh, <laughs> Uh, but he he openly talks about working for the CIA for a few summers interns, sure, and sure. you know once someone works for the CIA, they're never really out of it. You know yeah. that whole type well, of thing. Well, you know. It's, uh, but I wanted to uh, I brought that up because you mentioned uh, Brzezinski's name twice, and now MSNBC, Mina Brzezinski. This is her father, right? Right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So yes. I wanted to bring this to the attention of the listener who might not have been aware that her father was. What was he, National Security Advisor for Jimmy it is, Carter? It is Carter, yes. That's right. Yeah. And he's he like the, the father of psycholo psychological operations. Am I? Uh, yeah, well, he, he certainly he had a lot to do with it. And he right. also he also is a futurist. I mean, he looked at, I think he wrote a book uh, called The Techno Technotronic Evolution or Revolution or something like that back in the 1970s. And what would eventually happen to to citizens of the world and citizens of the United States. Sounds like we're here there. And we're so, now yeah, here. we are there. Sounds like look, he was writing a plan. Yeah. You look back at stuff that was written back in the 1960s and the 1970s, well, the chess pro too. projecting about where we were going to be and how they were going to manage society. And Brzezinski was one of the key factors in that. Yeah. In fact, it's he not, actually it's... even came out at one point about, what, eight, eight or nine years ago. And he was, it was in an address to, uh, 2017. Uh, yeah, to to the CFR, to the Council of Foreign Relations, I believe, where he said, you know, he said, we got to watch out because the public is getting very, they're kind of getting on, they're very political and they're very aware of what we're up to. They're waking up. They're waking up. And he mm, said, you wow. know, what are, what are we going to be? We got to be very well aware of the fact we got to start constructing things whereby we can retain the control that we have always had traditionally, he said, because People are aware in a sense that they've never been aware before in history. So the old tools don't work anymore. So what are we going to do? So he was really, a, you know, very far sighted in terms of his ability. Of course, he was working for David Rockefeller. And, uh, you know, I don't well, think David Rockefeller is actually looking out for our best interests. Well, not only that, looking out for his own best interests. David Rockefeller created the Trilateral Commission right. with Brzezinski, and they picked <clears throat> Jimmy Carter basically as president. 
And then they brought in all the trilaterals right into the Jimmy Carter administration. So you're looking at a whole process that comes from this kind of thinking right. where they view the public as a nuisance that they have to kind of mm -hmm. take care of. And when you get a little bit too uppity, they, you know, they want to figure out how to get rid of you. I mean, at this point, the government press conference is a very much, and they've been resembling this for some time, a Saturday Night Live routine. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think we'd probably be better off being run by Saturday Night Live at this point. Yeah. So yeah. comical the thing has really become. Yeah, and uh, just like we had the Trilateral Commission back in Jimmy Carter, now we have the CFR is uh, running the U.S. government right now. Well, you've got, you know, but you've got Skull and Bones, you've right. got the Bilderberger Group, Council on Foreign Relations. It's all secret I mean, societies. And that, it's, that, you know, and those are the starts, ones we heard about. They're right. all part of it, but yeah. that's the point. Right. In fact, that was very much a part of what mm. Rhodes created. Rhodes right. had the whole idea of creating secret societies that you basically comb the, 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 all the five eyes, all our mm -hmm. old colonies with these secret societies and you position people and then you get them to go along with what you want. It was a plot that he instituted back in the, you know, obviously in the well, late 19th I mean, century before he died. At the end of World War II, the United, the CIA and the OSS and the CIG, different names before it became the CIA, all went in, they went in and they basically picked up these Nazi intelligence operations that were being run behind Soviet lines and brought them over lock, stock and barrel. Uh, yeah. to, Reinhard Galen was running the whole operation behind Soviet lines and he, uh, he, they made him a Knight of Malta. They brought him in, they put him in charge of the, of the German, <laughs> the Bundesnacht Richtendienst, the, the German intelligence operation for West Germany in the 1950s and 60s. So, you know, it, it's like it never changed. Yeah, Operation you Paperclip actually, leads to exactly. MK Ultra, right. MK Often, MK Search, uh, Nazis and uh, right. running NASA, you know, it's it's all so connected mm -hmm. and uh, and it also goes it connects to the Bible uh, in yeah. so many different ways. Like this prophecy has been foretold that Th these types of events would happen over and over in our history. And we're in another section of history where it's coming to its completion of the Babylonian empire, the Roman empire, mm -hmm. you know, right. to that effect it, it's, and the people are waking up and it's just so incredible when you look at something like you two are wonderful journalists. You've been doing this for decades. And when I tell my mother or father something along these lines, they'll listen to me a little bit, but then it gets to a point and they're like, no, you can't be right, because this would be all over the news. Yeah, I would right, know this right, if exactly. it was true. But exactly. then when I have such uh, distinguished people as yourselves, journalists who helped get the Soviets out of Afghanistan in the 80s when the Soviets realized they shouldn't have invaded in the first place, that they were tricked by the Americans in order to do it, and you two were there in the forefronts of this, and you're saying these things that, you know, I get called a crazy conspiracy theorist for, <laughs> and you guys are, are actually experiencing these types of things. You know, this is really big times. And we, I think the people, not just of America, but of the world are waking up mm -hmm. to see that it's all been propaganda, that there's been a few people at the top who have been doing these things and telling us that it's, oh no, it's not this. You know, I didn't just punch you right there. No, no, I, I just, I walked over here and you walked over there and then I kind of, you know, this happened. Yeah. They make it seem like it's something it's not. And it's just, it's very refreshing yeah. speaking to I, you. I, I can't, I can't forget that day that Roger came back to the hotel after being at the Soviet embassy and he was just totally he flustered. Was he was aghast. Yeah. He said, he said, the guy came down from Moscow just to meet me. And he said, Roger, he said, you know, we make mistakes, but we're not stupid. Please just <laughs> help us, us get out. Help us get yeah, out of here. Yeah. There's no right. reason for us to be here. Right. We really, right. we want to let the but, Afghans settle this for themselves. So, you know, just give us six months right. and, and but, we'll do it. But the bottom line was when we brought that story back to yeah. ABC Nightline and Ted Koppel, they completely misrepresented the story to make it appear as if there was nothing to follow up, there was no opportunity, and they completely let it drop in yeah. Washington. But I do wanna make one very, I think very clear point though about prophecy. I think the most important thing to always remember about all the prophecies is that that's all they are. It does not guarantee how it actually has to end. 
right. we are in a position of power to make it end in a way that we know that we want it to end, that we know it needs to end. And we have to think deeply about how to get to that that good place that we all want it we to We have be. a choice between- That's a great uh, statement there. Yes, it is. We have, we have that choice between good and evil and we have to make that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to spend a few minutes here, if you guys don't mind, about on 9-11. Were you guys in uh, Afghanistan or, or at no, least? No, no. Well, okay. by 9-11, um, we were actually working with our Afghan partner, Seema Wali. It was at a point where we had once again left the story. Um, and because of her, we got back in it. And she turned out to be the heart and soul of Afghanistan. And we ended up trying to help her empower her voice. She had an organization called Refugee Women in Development. She was actually the first Afghan to come to this country in 1978 after the a coup that caused the whole problem in her country. And um, so we, we, you know, we, we had a, a reason, we had a motivation. It was, uh, of course, what was it? It was personal. So by 9-11, what happened to us then was because everybody suddenly wanted to know everything instantly. We felt, oh, wow, this is it. We've got our chance. It's gonna happen now, right? And we had gone through our thing with the networks in the early eighties, and now we had another chance. And through the, you know, through the 2000s, we did our two books and we did all kinds of talks and this and that. And what did we discover? It didn't solve the problem. And we ended up confronting the same crisis we discovered in the 1980s when we first went through the routine, which is that facts at some point don't change a narrative that's already been written and that is already predetermined. It's, it's, it's mm. already done. And we had to come up with a new way to think about what we could do to feel better about what we had experienced. And the only thing we could come up with was writing our own narrative and coming up with a new way to define what we knew we had experienced. And because the, the narrative that is being run by the mainstream media does not include so much of the complexity of what Americans need to know, especially. So it, it, that's what our job became, trying to write a narrative. And that's mm. what the valediction really is. The book that, you know, that we recently published is about that completion, about coming full circle to another place. It's yeah. not just about uh, who did what to whom. It's about what are we doing this for? The, Why are we doing this The idea was to take, a, to, to take the reader through our experience from the very beginning what motivated us, some of the things that we came across, and uh, and and give you the perspective that we had. Take but walking you, through it for forty years. Take you into right. our perspective, through, see it through our eyes, how we saw this eventually, you know, come to come to pass, and um, you know, and and work that through. And I think it's you know I, you know, some of the people who like history books uh, said. Why did you why did you do it this way? Why did you tell it this way? Well, it's very compelling to tell it this way because it's very easy. I mean, I open it myself now and then. I just open it up and I, I say, boy, that I'm in I'm in the story. And I have to say, wait a minute, that's my story. I wrote that. But the fact is, is that it works that way. When I try to, you know, you when you try to edit well, your own work, you try to set up yourself up as a is an objective reader, you know? So right. uh, anyway, I, I would advise it on that basis alone is that it's a, you know, it's a quick and easy read. And it, uh, <laughs> it, it, it gives you where we, where we came from and how we got to where we are right now. The beginning oh, of it. Anyway. Only, only 40 years later. <laughs> only, 40 years. only took 40 years. To do uh, so, so how long after 9-11, the event occurred, did you guys realize it was bullshit? Oh. Well, we already, knew, we already knew uh, at the, uh, when it okay. happened. It's like, but oh, so this it, is it was a new layer mm. of understanding because mm. we actually, you know, because when we actually originally left the story in the, it was by 1987 and we moved into screenwriting because we realized, you know, journalism wasn't going to get us anywhere. Facts didn't matter. That's what we discovered. And we eventually ended up trying to, you know, write screenplays and got to Oliver Stone and got his interest in you know, in basically writing a story about our journalistic experience only to discover that Hollywood is completely useless. That, you know, that they, they, we came to realize that there was no way that they were capable 
of representing what we were trying to represent. There's a, but at that point, there's a wall there that yeah. you don't even see. I yeah. mean, you hit the walls here and there in your career, and you're trying to get this done or get that job or do this, get this sort of thing. And you're focused on, you know, the immediate the job and the immediate the job thing, and yeah. the immediate, you know, effort to get it done. But you're not looking way down the road yeah. and realizing that there's a barrier there that, you, you know, once yeah. you get to it, and we got to that barrier. In this particular case, we got to the barrier very early. We were informed, fortunately, by the former ambassador uh, to the United, uh, to, to uh, uh, Afghanistan, Ted Elliott, Theodore Elliott, who had been there for six years in the 1970s, who showed up at the, the first premiere of our documentary, documentary in 1981 at a, at a local hotel and uh, uh, it showed the thing, the footage that I had seen, the experiences that I'd had, the women's groups, the various things that were being done, the schools with kids in them, the fact that the Mujahideen were burning down these schools and blowing up power lines, things like that. And he stood up at the end. And this, the, the, you're talking about one of these old State Department. Uh, uh, Theodore uh, Elliott, uh, I think it says. Purit it Puritans that came over here in the, you know, in the in the 17th century. He stands up. He's about six foot eight, and he goes, "Who gave you permission to tell this story?" And he does this in front of a room full of journalists, and you could hear the. How about the Constitution? <laughs> you could you could hear the collective gasp. Of the entire room went. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy challenging an American citizen to tell a story, to show pictures about something journalist. he yeah. doesn't want shown. Yeah. Who gave you permission? And I said, I didn't need permission to go and do this. There's no, there's no prohibition from the American government on going to Afghanistan. In fact, we still have trade relations with the government of Afghanistan, even in the Soviet occupation. And he said, you are treading very closely to being a conduit for Soviet propaganda. You'd better be very careful. And he did, and everyone said, and I said, you know, I said, I'm a little too young to have experienced the McCarthy era, but I've read a lot about it and I've heard a lot about it. And a lot of literature has been written about it. And I said, you know, I said, when you look back on it, it really didn't do this country any good. And the people who were involved in it were really kind of desperate to suppress information about what the world is going through. So I said, you know, I said, I don't think it would be very good for me to stop telling the story that I'm telling right now. And the entire room stood up in applause and, and gave me a standing ovation. And this wow. poor guy had to shrivel his six foot eight inch frame just kind of sat it, it deflated in front of it into his chair and and that was it and that was like you know that's <laughs> symbolic of uh, what game, if we all stand together what we can oh, exactly. accomplish yeah. we'll right. but, it but it took right it took that one courage person standing up and looking this guy in the eye and in saying, the eye. I, I, i'm sure you have much more information a thousand times more information and background on this situation than i have okay well, we didn't know but all i'm doing here is presenting what i saw and i want this audience to know that nobody's been there for two years this is the first look that anybody's had of about what this government is trying to do and what the Soviets are doing in Afghanistan. And, and that was it. And, yeah. and so, and I, that's why I got the standing ovation and he didn't. Right. And uh, I'll give yeah. you another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. But uh, anyway, so that's, that's kind of what our experience is. And that's what the valediction is all about. And our other two books that we wrote on this uh, back in uh, 2010, 2008 and 2011, are, are um, you know, they're very good background books. They give you just the really the factual story, annotated, detailed, um, you know, and the perspective from other people. But like so many other things uh, in this world, when you actually, we're very sheltered here in the United States. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I think the American people suffer from that. Uh, we would be, you don't have enough people who get up and go out to the experience and have the experience themselves about what's really going on. You know, right. you look, you're, people are looking they at can't. it. They, they, they can't. can't do and, it. and the the media today is, you know, we got up, we, we got a story. We walked into CBS News on West 57th Street. We negotiated a deal. We got, you know, the money to go off to Afghanistan, which was a lot of money at that time to bring an entire, to bring a camera crew and rent, you know, 
high level cameras and an Ikigami camera was like $75,000 just for the wow. camera. And we had to haul that all that stuff into Afghanistan on our backs and get that story and sit down and then come back and sit there with the CBS News editors and hammer out a, you know, a story that, that at least represented a, a shadow of what we did anyway. And so, and then do it again two years later with Roger Fisher for, for ABC Nightline. So that's the kind of thing that we did. And you can't do that now. Well, you can't even, you know, you can't, here we have this incredible media capability. We have the internet, and we have shows like yours, we have all these things in which we can basically, you know, you can put a camera in your pocket and go to Afghanistan. Well, that that is good though, I think. That's, that the, so much. that's the good news. Yeah. That's the good yeah. news. And you yeah. have to believe in yourself and the fact that you can make a difference with that, with that voice. And here we are 40 years later, still talking about that experience and wanting to share it with, with people like you and your audience. Well, you guys definitely deserve a, an award for all of your hard work and your dedication and uh, all that you have done in order to expose the truth for 40 years. And, you know, how 9-11 didn't come, to, come as a surprise to you guys is just like, you know, to someone who thinks that 9-11 was a organic event that was created by a terrorist who hate America because of their freedoms, you know, uh, this will come to a huge shock to, to some people if this is the first. But it's hearing. refreshing that we're not the only one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that, and that you guys were so in-depth into something that you could see something was occurring and when it occurred, you're like, oh, that's what it had been in the works. Uh, so... You know, we live in a place where uh, you talked. To, you mentioned the Hollywood people, uh, and we were talking about the CIA and the government and all these wealthy people and all these secret societies. What they all have in common is that they all pretend to be something they're not. They all have made a lifetime of pretending, whether you're a government official, a CIA or an intelligence agency, or you're Hollywood, they're all pretending to be something that they're not in order to get us to do things for them. So with that being said, what do you think we can do as Americans? Uh, what can we do to help get the truth out to people? How, how can we overcome these rulers of this earth? Well, I think for the, I would say the first thing we have to accept is the fact that they are a part of us. They're not separate. And I, I think the, the, the step one is, I think we have to step back from the duality, you know, the Manichaeanism of good and evil, because right. it's too easy to judge. The, the problem with good and evil is that if you choose to use force to do anything at all, and you start out on the side of good, you are going to end up eventually becoming evil in the use of force. And that is really the situation. So what you know, what we're dealing with is all ideas. We're dealing with the power of ideas. And there are a lot of people who have used them to forcefully. I mean, you look at uh, the neocons and their power over American foreign policy, which is a whole separate subject we haven't even touched on with you that we could talk about, okay? The people that Brzezinski actually represented in the power that he used to completely turn American foreign policy in a direction that it was not going in based on what happened at the end of the Vietnam War, which was we were moving towards supposedly detente and peace treaties and assault treaty in order to move away from war. And okay. redirecting and, that and money redirected. towards And he was able purpose. to completely direct it back. Yeah. And what Reagan cheered was the fact that uh, the, the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan cured Americans of the, of the problem of the, they called it the Vietnam syndrome, meaning uh, people, the Americans were no longer interested in war. They wanted peace and they did, these people do not like that. So we have to be clear about what they represent in us and what we wanna stop them from doing. They are doing it based on, I think a very ancient connection to that power and they still think they possess it. They don't, but we haven't asserted our authority over that yet. We have to begin to think about, but you can't just come up to one of these powerful forces and say, you're over. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. You really have to know what you're talking about. You have to know where you come from. You have to know what motivates you. 
And I think that's all part of it. That's what we took 40 years, over 40 years, actually. We've been together since 1970. So, you know, as a oh, couple, wow. Congratulations. You, know, through a, you know, a whole process of experience that involves our families. It involves at a very personal level, choices we made and, and the crises that we hit along the way because of those choices and how we had to still keep going um, in the face of those choices. And so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, qualities you've got to balance. And when you sort of come out fighting and you don't know what you're fighting for really. And, you know, I'd say, honestly, for most Americans, the first thing to accept is basically most of you know nothing about what, what this is about, nothing. That is the truth. I mean, most people in America right now probably think that the film Charlie Wilson's War, and I don't know if you're familiar with that film. Uh, I've heard of it. I yes, haven't seen exactly. it. Exactly. At least you've heard of it. Okay. Most Americans think that Charlie Wilson's War, the Hollywood big thing with Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts, is the, uh, you know, is basically the whole idea about America's role in, in Afghanistan. Charlie Wilson's war is the propaganda story, 100%. It has nothing to do with reality at all, okay? And that is really a big pill to have to swallow for a lot of people, that, they're, that they, what they actually know is, is nothing. They actually, what, it'd be better if they knew nothing than that. Right, that's like, Quentin Tar that. <laughs> that's like the way Quentin Tarantino, he uh, makes these movies that are based off of real events and then he completely perverts it and yeah. and makes it into, you know, what was the one with uh, uh, the Charles Manson that he just made? And the, at the, Holly end of the Hollywood, yeah. Yeah, they're all partying and it's like, wait, that's not what happened. Yeah, right, 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 exactly. So and and so nobody remembers the history. They remember the movie, though, and they're like, oh, yeah, that, that must have been real. Yeah. They wouldn't have made a movie if it wasn't real. Uh, yeah, well, that, well, look, at that's what Charlie Wilson was. He was a womanizer. He was a sharp guy. He was smoothy goozy and everyone just smoozy loved him. Smoothy goozy, that's right. One. That's my word for him. <laughs> Liz, that's a good one. <laughs> no, well, you know, that's just it. And and the American people, as I said, you know, uh, we have really been isolated. The, the wall is around the United States in terms of the information wall. And we, we discovered it early on back in the 1970s, you know, overseas, listening to people who'd come out of Hollywood, as it turned out, and, uh, you know, listening to them talk about what they were experiencing. Uh, in the Soviet Union, and it was like, it was like, they weren't even, they, they didn't even know what they were looking at, because it was just so different from what they thought, perceived, they yeah. were, they were what they perceived, and it was, you know, it was, to see the confusion in their heads, and, and then going out to Hollywood, and dealing with some of these people, and dealing with Oliver Stone, and his, and his process, um, it really, uh, we got a, we got another education in terms of Perception. how, you know, how the narrative is framed and how it's presented to the American people and why when push comes to shove, uh, you know, I mean, how, you know, we keep putting ourselves and, the, the, you know, Vietnam was a repeat of the failures of, of Korea. And then Iraq was a repeat of the failures of Vietnam. And Afghanistan mm -hmm. is the, you know, the, the graveyard of empires. And, Anybody in their right mind would say, don't go into Afghanistan. Whatever you do, don't put an army in there. Don't dedicate your national resources to, to Afghanistan. And it's just, you know, and that kind of gets kind of mystical too, because that's, uh, you know, it's almost a, a quasi mystical effort when you realize what it is you're dealing with. You're dealing with a place that is ancient in terms of its history, 7,000 years worth of history. And you go there, and a lot of that history is still buried in the ground. Uh, Gandharan Buddhism, when I was there in 1981, one of the places they let me go to was Jalalabad. And they took me out with a, a truck full of troops and tanks and everything else to see this, this uh, Greco-Buddhist temple uh, that had been constructed during the time of Alexander the Great. And I really didn't know anything about this area at the time, and I didn't know about the whole Hellenistic uh, invasion uh, with Alexander up into South Central Asia during that time period, the second, third century uh, BC. And, uh, and it was like, what the heck is this all about? It's very, I mean, it's just the landscape, just the look of the place, the smell of the place, 
uh, it, there's just this feeling about it that you can feel the power radiating out of the soil at you and the people are so oh, wow. alive. You know, you come back here and people are so distracted by 10,000 different things. And you go to Afghanistan, you talk to a human being, he's looking at you from the same eyes that they would have looked at you from 5,000 years ago. They live on the ground, they're the, the, you know, watching the traffic in Kabul, you know, somebody coming home from a day's work with a stopping in a shop to buy naan, the flatbread, you know, uh, buy vegetables in the, in the market. Uh, walking down the street, I took a photograph of a, of a grocer sitting, sitting in his marketplace in, on a hot, warm afternoon just with his eyes closed. And I took a picture and I walked down the street and the people that were with me started yelling. They said, he woke up, he woke up. He wants you to take another picture of him awake. So <laughs> I go back, I got my camera, I go back and take another picture. The guy sitting there, he's got a big smile on his face. I have those two pictures on my wall, you know, as a reminiscent of, of my time there in 1983. But, wow. but that's what it is. The guy's got his turban on. He's got it. And I'm sure his father did it. And his father's father did it. And his father's father's father did it. And, and it just reconnects you to your own mortality. And but the, also your humanness. I in your, human, in your humanity. Yeah. I mean, the fact is, is that it's just, it's just such a, people were just so beautiful. And their expression of love and hope and, you know, oh, you're an American, maybe you can help us, you know, help us get the, tell the Russians to go home. We, do, we don't want them here, you know. We'd ra much rather have the Americans here. That's what they but said. But the Americans in, wouldn't help them. 1983, mm. you know, they, that's what they said, yeah. you know, we, if we had to choose between the Americans and the Russians, we'd take the Americans. Well, they've had the Americans for 20 years. And they didn't help them. I don't think the, the help, yeah. they got the help that they needed. No. It was very simple, you know. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I, you were talking about that ancient site. I think that there's some kind of stargate or portal or something to that effect in Afghanistan and or somewhere in the Middle East. You know, I was just playing with Google Earth the other day, and there's a big triangle on top of the North Pole. Uh, of there's some kind of distortion in the field in the atmospheric field you can see there's a distortion of a a triangle with the top cut off and where that top is cut off at is uzbekistan and right above that is afghanistan oh uh, yeah well, so well that, there, you know, there were some russian philosophers in the 19th century right. who believed that the the minor pamir mountains in that range in the hindu kush that What's that was the pamir Pamir, P-A-M-I-R. Uh, Pamir. Pamir okay. Mountains. Uh, the, that that was the original Garden of Eden. Uh, mm. There's some really good stuff on. I can yeah. I can send you the links oh, to some yes, of it. Yes, I'll they, take Really, it. they waxed yeah. very eloquent about yeah. um, about the nature of the uh, the very mystical the mystical power of those mountains and the way considered... that the world was going to converge on this place right. during that time period. I mean, he, when he prophesied, actually uh, the the uh, mystic prophesied that this was the first step towards bringing back the Garden of Eden because right. this oh, was in wow. the 19th century right. when there were talks between this would have been the czarist uh, empire Russia and, and Britain, in, yeah. in Britain okay coming together through these mountains and you know here we are again with America representing basically Britain effectively yeah wow well wow, this is amazing I, I was trying to pull up I don't know what happened I was trying to pull up Google Earth to show you guys but it pulled up something else all right here mm -hmm. we go i'm going to try to pull this up real quick because it's very interesting there it appears that there's some kind of eye i'll get it on uh share the screen in a moment here it appears that there's some kind of eye that is right on top of afghanistan if mm -hmm. i could figure it out eye of rock maybe <laughs> uh, yeah well it could be so it, it yeah. yeah so let me share my screen here real quick all right, so I got the screen share going on. All right, if you see, there's like this distortion right over here. Oh, yeah, I see it, yeah. Yeah, I, so I didn't have it up, so I don't exactly know uh, where I'm looking at right here. Uh, I'm trying to do this on the fly, sorry. But you can see, okay, here we go. Let me turn it a little bit more. I, so is this... Okay, this is the Pentagon. This is the South Pole. You see, there's it's like a Pentagon shape down here. Okay, yeah, you, I see it. You see, uh, still... yeah, it, it's very odd. I've never seen that before. And then you get up here, and you got the tri or the yeah triangle I and a pyramid shape. Yeah, yeah, there it is. There. Yeah, I can't even. 
Yeah, it looks right like now. it has an eye at the top of it yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Triangle with an yeah, eye. Well, that's okay, here we go. Now I, I'm getting it. That's yeah. pretty raw to me. <laughs> yeah, and so then uh, we got what Afghanistan is like right around here. Yeah, it's in that area. Yeah. So uh, let's see. The, you see this eye looking thing right here? This looks yeah. like it oh, could yeah. be. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Certainly. Yeah. So who, and there's another one right here. You know, who knows what these this stuff could be some kind of uh thing that they and you know it's not that far apart and look you got afghanistan uzbekistan kazakhstan all right there right yeah exactly it's very interesting right. stuff right. yeah the, the more idea, yeah. yeah the more that i research everything the more i see it's all secret societies doing things and it goes back to the fallen angels and uh, the Nephilim, and they're just the same bloodlines carrying out the same tasks that have been going on for millennia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's just it. And they're working in the background, and they have mm -hmm. been. And, uh, you know, uh, they have various, since they work through various institutions. And, you know, every so often, you know, you come across an agenda, and there's like someone told us once, they said, you may not understand it. It may not make sense from the outside, but it's all internally consistent. Right. But if yeah. you were if you yeah. were born into one of these families, of course, you're you're you know you're privy to a lot of this constant flow of information that is not generally made available to the public. But I think what we're coming up to now is the public, uh, you know, the human, um, obviously the humans, you know, the ones right. that obviously you know the Anunnaki tablets made very clear the attitude that the elites had towards the humans. And I think we're still seeing that in our leadership. And I really personally think that that is a direct effect of what I think is the, at this point, the poisoning process of imperial thinking. And that once you are cleansed of imperial thinking, you go back to being a human again. I think the biggest problem a lot of these people are going to suffer from is their inability like a war, you know, like some of these soldiers coming out of Vietnam and, and Iraq and, and Afghanistan, they're not going to be able to handle what they actually did when they were under this spell. And right. that's what is going to be there. And if anybody thinks you're going to have to put them on trial and do all this horrible stuff to make them pay a price, believe me, their own suffering will come from their realization of what they did, if they can yeah. handle it. So and it's perfect timing for this episode will be out next week uh i think next thursday so a week from today it'll be october when the veil is at its thinnest ah, and, it's coming yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, right. we're we're in the time of judgment right now uh astrologically speaking i'm not into astrology but it just you know it works out that we're in libra right now so it's just it's a very um, it's a very wait and see attitude that I have, but I am very optimistic in that the soon the tables will turn in our favor. And, you know, there are massive events going on all over the world right now. There's different scary things happening all over the place that we can be scared about and we can yeah. get an uproar about. But as you said uh, so perfectly, Liz, that if we try to fight war with war, we're just going to get more war. Yes. Uh, we need to somehow, as a people, figure this thing out by using our intelligence, by using our words, and not hurtful, hurtful angry words, mm -hmm. but words that will get us together, even though nobody's always going to agree. You know, mm -hmm. what makes us different makes us beautiful. It completes <laughs> us all. Exactly. So, so we need to just get to a place where we can understand each other, have empathy for one another, love each other in uh, a grand sense and really all put a concerted effort to not hurt anybody and to mm -hmm. just and to make it better for all of us instead of wasting our time yeah. on on different things we could actually be figuring out the place that we live in to make it the most beautiful place ever yeah sounds exactly. good to me sounds absolutely <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful philosophy yes Exactly. Yeah, well, I, I hope that it uh, it comes to fruition sooner than later. Is I, there a... I, I agree with you. I, 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 I feel you're, you're right on the money. Yeah, I, I yeah. think we're there. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I, I hope we are. Uh, is there anything you guys would like to leave our audience with? Oh, God, that's always a, a tough, uh, a, a single word, you know. Uh, you know, 
I mean, I think, you know, I think that, you know, we have, we have found, I mean, my, my, my simplest directive, whenever I, mm. I'm not sure, you know, where to go, what to do, I always say, make it personal, make it personal, you know, go for the personal, try to fix things at the personal level, try to understand things at the personal level, and then move out from there. Okay. Don't start with this macro insanity, just make it personal. That's perfect. Yeah. I'll agree with that. Yeah, that, that is really perfect. You know, as above, so below, there's, diff there's exactly. the same thing as happening, repeating scales. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I can't clean up the trash, the litter of everybody, but I can clean up the litter that I come across. Exactly. So if and I'm doing that, then... One person at a time, yeah. Right, right. I want to thank you guys again so much for coming on. You want to ask them about their uh, grounding technique? Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> I, I forgot. So I like to ask all my guests at the end of the episode, what their uh, favorite grounding technique and favorite relaxation technique is. So, you know, like ground yourself to, maybe the world gets too crazy for you sometimes. Maybe the there's some, probably. yeah, maybe the information is too overwhelming at sometimes. How do you bring yourself back to being a human, relaxing, you know, enjoying your life? You guys seem like such a great couple as well. You know, I'm sure that you have many couples things and uh, <laughs> solo things that you like to do. Liz. Okay. <laughs> well, of course, I have all kinds of all kinds of ideas sparkling in my head about what you just asked. Um, you know, I, 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 I think as what I said about making it personal. You know, it really comes down to making it simple, <clears throat> and not getting caught up in the the bull. Okay, just trying to stay clear and trying to stay as 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 thoughtful and as, as, um, as, as I think as generous as you're capable of, meaning mm -hmm. you create a platform for someone to crash on, okay? You will get paid back in spades, all right? If you can handle it, but you gotta make sure you can handle the crash. I mean, that's important, right? You've gotta make sure you've built enough of a strength in yourself to handle the crash. And that may be the biggest problem some people mm -hmm. suffer from is they didn't realize what they were really inviting in. And sometimes you've got to be realistic about that and, you know, and, and be honest about that and then, you know, heal yourself and then take it on again, you know. <laughs> so I think it is said, you know, it's a personal building process and keep mm -hmm. it as simple. I think there's too many people who are caught up in too many unimportant issues, relationships, uh, battles, you know, that they can't possibly, you know, be useful to them or, you know, make their intimate personal life really better. I just like to keep my <clears throat> my life focused on the, the smaller things in life that I can deal with. I was always a model maker when I was a kid. I always enjoyed making models, modeling <clears throat> whatever the, the the world was around me, whether it was automobiles or planes or, what, or ships. And uh, I, I came across uh, some old Tonka trucks many years ago at the local at the local transfer station. And uh, I said, you know, someday I'm going to have grandkids probably and they might come in handy. They might enjoy these things. So I started collecting whenever I came across an old Tonka truck or a die, you know, die cast metal truck. I, I'd start to work on it. Which they don't make now. They don't make anything even resembling. Oh, there you go. So anyway, so it turns out I do have two grandsons and a, and a granddaughter, but my grandsons adore the Tonka trucks. And we I, have a we have a basement filled to the brim mm -hmm. with these trucks and it's considered santa's santa's santa's, <laughs> santa's <laughs> workshop, santa's uh, workshop. <laughs> i, I love sanding these things down and taking care of them and and just kind of you know repainting them and and i found a youtube video uh, that i sat with my two grandsons and i showed them how they 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 um, uh, sandblasted all the rust off a off a truck i, I hatched i actually had the, the truck that they were sandblasting the rust off and wow. those two kids, they're like three years old and five years old. And they looked at that and they were just like, wow, that's how you do it. That's how you make them all nice and shiny and you build things. So that's the idea. And, and that's what I focus on with my grandkids is that uh, to build Ooh. something new or take something old, refix it, bring it back, restore it to whatever the original creator's idea was in, in their mind and then show it to them take them through the process step by step and show them what a wonderful thing this can be. 
And that, and that's such a beautiful story. And they love it. I mean, they just absolutely adore it. A next door neighbor, a new neighbor who moved in, she said, I saw you with your grandkids and the trucks you had for them. This must be heaven for them. <laughs> so it was, it's heaven for me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is a beautiful a story and it's such a great metaphor for what god is doing to us breaking us all the way down in order to restore us to our perfection in the eye of what his the creator his mind was with when he created us mm -hmm. and he's restoring us and it's going to be a process but I have been getting restored and I can feel it coming for everyone else as well. And uh, I want to thank you guys again so much for coming on. This was such a, a great conversation. You enlightened me to so many different things. And I'm sure that all of my listeners that are on the, uh, you know, on the verge of looking into different conspiracy theories, quote unquote, conspiracy theories will take this episode and they will fall right off that edge and into the <laughs> rabbit hole. <laughs> Uh, is there? Do you guys want to let my audience know where you, you can get? They can get your books. Is it oh, Amazon yeah, well, or? We, ha we have a website called valediction.net. Okay. Um, the name of the book is The Valediction: uh, Three Nights of Desmond, but the, the website is valediction.net, and 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 that's a good place to start. Yeah, publisher is Trine Day, and yeah. uh, they're doing a great job of getting the book out there, and they've been wonderful to work with. It's, it's been great. Yeah. Oh, that that is wonderful. I will. You too. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I will, of course, have that all in the notes. And we are going to say goodbye to our audience. Goodbye, everybody. We will talk to you later.